Are you a real estate investor looking to sharpen your skills or a newbie looking to become one? You're in the right place. Welcome to Where Should I Invest? Real Estate Investing in Canada with your host, Sarah Larby. Ritu, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on. You, uh, you're a huge inspiration. I was uh, reading a little bit about what you've done in the past and uh, really wanted to have you on the show so you can share your, your journey uh, with us. And uh, so let's just maybe get started and maybe just give us a high level of, of you know, what it is that you do and we'll go from there. Sure. So my official title is the ambassador of the Gupta Group. And a lot of people ask me, what does that even mean? So uh, to be honest, it's more of a CEO chair position, but I chose the word ambassador because it was a lot more female. And I feel like CEOs in this whole executive world is so male dominated. Okay. Um, but I wanted to kind of create a position for myself that was more female oriented. Um, so what our family business does, my parents came from India um, many, many years ago and they started hospitality and they started with a truck stop. So now we're in hotel and residential real estate. Uh, we have a portfolio of about 25 hotels across Canada and we have five more on the go that should be developing. One's actually opening in a few weeks and a couple of others that should open in the next couple of years. My brother and I also launched a VC called Rogue Infant Capital and I'm also the head of my family foundation. That's sort of me in a, in a nutshell. I love that. So it's a family-based business. And were you always interested in joining the family business or did it come uh, throughout the years? You know, I was one of the weird ones where it was, I was always interested in it and it was just something that I always found family business really fascinating. And you'll see, you know, you can see in history, there's so many companies that are family owned that people don't really know about. And I just think there's a, there's a different level of of internal power. Like it's like a, for me, I, 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 I get my power from knowing that it's a family business from knowing that I have, I basically internally have this group of people that will support me no matter what. And maybe it's because they're obligated to, because they're family. <laughs> to stay. Yeah. Because you constantly have a support structure. Yeah, absolutely. And you know what? One of the things that you mentioned, uh, you know, a couple of minutes ago is it, it's a very male dominated industry. And so it's great to see other women in the, in the field as well. Um, what are maybe some of the, you know, could be challenges or opportunities that you've seen, you know, doing what you do in your role um, as a, a woman leader? Oh, my God. We do not have enough time. <laughs> I have seen and I've experienced. Um, I've been in board meetings where I'm the only female and I, I, I wear glasses once in a while and I walked in and the male, some of them kind of looked at me and said, oh, today you look like a sexy librarian because that's appropriate you know, for a board, you know, for a board meeting. Um, and then when I would speak and I would give my opinion, they would raise their voice 15 decibels higher than mine and start laughing with a billowing laughter, trying to drown me out. And it was very clear. It's very evident immediately what, what they're doing. And I'm sure a lot of females had been in this exact position. And so for me, my MO was never to bring people down, never to get angry, um, always wanting to put business first and also making sure that, you know, Unfortunately, as female, the second that you get mad, you're labeled, right? You're labeled as bitchy. I hate to use that word and I'm sorry, but that's somehow always the word that's only used for females. Don't know why. Um, so I just stayed quiet. And I knew that because I knew what I had to say was important, that I would have a I would have a time to be able to speak and to be able to be heard. So I just waited. And I waited for everything to quiet. I waited for all their fake laughter to quiet down. And then I spoke and I gave my opinion and what I thought we should do. And everybody went silent. Because I know that despite their egos, they knew that it was the right way forward. So I think for me, and one thing that I would tell everyone is that it's anger is not ever the way to handle anything. And you just have to wait for the right time. And maybe that's, you know, when they're laughing over you and talking over you, it's just the universe saying, hold on, it's, it's not the right time. Yeah, no, absolutely. Very well said. I mean, I, I also look at it as an opportunity, you know, sometimes being, you know, there's less women in the real estate industry in general. So sometimes it's a, it's a competitive advantage. Has it ever worked as a competitive advantage in, in, you know, in your favor where maybe more women were drawn to you because you were also a woman? And I think there's, a, you know, that support uh, and connection as well. For sure. You know, it's interesting because I, I don't, I think being in this industry, I don't look at it as male versus female. I never have. Mm -hmm. And I'm lost that my parents also don't see it that way. And so, for example, when I became CEO, I was worried because we, you know, for how many years it was led by a male. And when I asked my dad, I said, dad, you know, are you worried about that? He looked at me like I was crazy. Mm -hmm. And said, what difference does that make? And I just thought, okay, if dad's feeling that, 
we're good. And I think for me, in terms of a competitive advantage, I just look at it that if I can, if I can be the source of inspiration for other women to kind of say, okay, you know what? I want to do that too. That's beautiful and that's amazing. So I think a lot of time, whether you're male or female, you look to other people to say, okay, they can do it, then I can do it. And I, I just hope that I can provide that for other people. Yeah, amazing. Now, are your parents still as actively involved in the business or have you and your brother mostly taken uh, over at that point? They're still very actively involved. Right. Yeah, yeah. Right. So walk us through, like, maybe just, I, I think a lot of us are curious. I mean, 25, you know, hotels is definitely a lot. Um, you know, what does a typical week look like for you in your role? You know, it's so funny because I'm, I'm interviewing right now to find an EA and everyone's asking that question. And I don't want to scare anybody, but mm. my weeks are never typical. And the reason why it's never typical is the one thing with the hotel industry is that your days are always different, which I love. I'm not someone that can just sit behind a desk and, you know, have that nine to five. Uh, with a family business, you're also, I mean, the downside is that you're working all the time and it's 8, 24 7. So my family dinners are not family dinners. They're basically board meetings. And you're kind of talking about, you know, this property is coming up or do we want to sell this? Or it's that, that kind of always happens. But I think for me, my, I don't really have a typical week, but what I like to do is I'll make sure within a week that I cover everything I want to cover. So maybe, you know, there's some plans to be that I want to look at. Maybe there's some properties I want to look at. Um, Seward and I on the rogue side, we might have to look at a few deals. So I just make sure that within a week, I'm able to achieve those goals. But I don't necessarily have a typical day or a typical week because, you know, a few weeks ago, we suddenly realized we had a huge problem with tile in one of our hotels. So now everything's upside down. So now I, you know, I'm supposed to have these Zoom meetings, but I can't because my office is being retiled. So it's just one of those things where every day is different, which I love, to be honest. Yeah, no, I it's that's I think that's why many of us like to be in the real estate industry, right? As investors or whatnot, because there is no day the same. There's, you know, big goals and big things and definitely big problems. The more you do, the more problems you have and the bigger they are. Um, you know, but that's that's part of the fun of it. Um, so are you able to share like a little bit like what hotels, um, just if there's any but you know, hotels that we might have heard of before, like what like are these all in Canada? Are they in everywhere? Of course, of course. So we um we're franchisees. So we basically have franchises with Hilton, Marriott, and IG. Um, so hotels you've definitely heard of. We have a residence in, in Toronto downtown. Uh, last year, we opened a Canopy by Hilton, which is the first one in Canada. That is at Blue Ridge River. Um, we're opening, literally in a few weeks, we're opening Reverie by Curio, which is another Hilton property. Um, that's a Peter in Adelaide. And that used to be a Hilton Garden Inn. Um, we also have, so we have a bunch of AGIs, we have a bunch of Marriott properties. Uh, we have a Weston by the airport. Um, so it's all brands that you would know if you're familiar with the Marriott, Hilton, and IHG world. Okay, so you stick to the big brands. You franchise, you, you essentially, you buy the franchise, the location. How do you do the analysis? Like, how do you decide that this is going to be where we're going to buy? This is the one we're going to buy versus something else? Like, I, I know it's probably very layered, but, you know, maybe just like in a quick overview. Of course, no, such is such a great question. So, for example... Um, with the Candy by Hilton, which is a hotel that we just opened last year. And this is right at Bloor and Sherburn. This, so this area, I'm sure everyone that knows Toronto knows that it was really just ripe for development and it really needed to have uh, some energy and some life brought back into it. So literally in 2012, Hilton launched this brand called Kennedy. And it was, it was literally just a sample brand. And they came to my dad and I and said, okay, we have a brand. Would you like to bring it to Canada? And my dad and I loved it because with this brand, what they do with it, it's not a typical cookie cutter brand. The brand itself pulls from the city around it. So I thought, okay, we can absolutely do something in Toronto. It'll be the first ever and we can bring Toronto into the hotel. Um, so we love this brand. And now we just had to look at our portfolio to say, where is it going to go? And my dad and I are always looking for sites, especially in Toronto. So when this site came up, we thought this is actually perfect because it's a lifestyle brand. It's close enough to York Bill that it can be upscale because this hotel is a four to four and a half star hotel. So really what we look at is, of course, everyone will say location, 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 right? That absolutely. But sometimes you also have to think a little outside of the box. If someone said 10 years ago to put a lifestyle brand in this area in Toronto, they probably would have said no because it, the area is a little run down. You know, there, there are a couple of homeless shelters around that area. People would have said no, but you also have to have a future vision, right? To be able to say, okay, but 10 years from now, what is this site going to look like? And that I think is more important than what the site looks like now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. This is, you know, I have a little, little boutique resort in the Kawarthas and it's in a very, very small town in the Kawarthas. Not many people have heard of it, but you know, we're trying to build the, uh, it's Kobukonk, Ontario. Oh. 
beautiful okay. so just uh 30 minutes north of Lindsay, and uh the the resort's called inspire beach resort it's small it's boutique we're creating it um you know but it's definitely not in toronto so we got to get the the eyeballs and everything um up there but um so somebody that's just starting out because obviously you guys have a pretty good sized portfolio um you know when your parents first started out or if you're going to recommend you know somebody start looking at that like if they wanted to look at a franchise opportunity like what are some of the key points that you can based on experience uh suggest that they might want to start with sure so we're we looking at how to build a franchise are we looking at location trying to get into the hotel industry yeah let's just say somebody that wants to get into the hotel industry you know through a similar avenue that you guys uh started beautiful so what i would suggest is there's different tiers of hotels, right? So we actually started with Choice. Choice hotels are maybe two-star, I would say, um, but they're very easy to manage. Um, and they're also a smaller footprint. So if you go into bigger hotels, which are two to 400 rooms, it's more difficult to manage because now, you know, you, basically you have to sell 400 rooms every single day, 365. That's not an easy thing to do. So if you're starting to get into the business, I would suggest that you look at locations where you, you know that the occupancy is pretty high. So if you're going to buy an existing property, you would look at the annual occupancy, look at the annual ADR and see firstly if that makes sense. Also look at the fact, had they a lot of times with hotels that they're being sold, you need to look at how are you going to increase this business. And that just takes a little bit of a deep dive to say, okay, what is the business in the outside areas? Can I increase the occupancy? Um, I would say in terms of key count, anything under 200 room for a first comer into the industry is no, I wouldn't say that it's easy to manage, but it's easier to manage than, you know, jumping in and saying, okay, I'm gonna buy a 400 room property. Um, also when you partner with brands, so when you partner with something like Choice Hotel or Travel Lodge, they really help you and they will hold your hand and they will give you all the tips in terms of how to manage the brand. And they also have amazing assets to show you about management and sales and all of that. So you're not going into it blind. Whereas if you were to start, you know, so for you, you've taken a really brave step to start something with Peak, you're doing everything with graph. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it's really, really tough. You have to create your own brand standards and all of that. So I would say... If someone is just getting this industry, um, that is a benefit. Obviously, you pay a fee for that. You know, it's not free. Mm -hmm. um, it is beneficial just so you can learn the industry a little more. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, I mean, it, it obviously says something if you guys have stuck to that concept as well, right, of buying the franchises. Um, so if somebody that's starting, like what what kind of, I mean, obviously there's, a, there's I'm assuming, uh, upfront fees and then there's also like the royalty fees or whatever the franchise fees that you're paying. Like what is, let's just say choice hotels as an example, like what should somebody have, you know, in terms of expectations from a, a cash influx? Oh, you know what? That's really location dependent, right? So if you're going with choice, the, the royalty wouldn't be, and the fees that you're paying are going to be as high as the Marriott, right? Which is a huge benefit. Mm. Uh, but it really depends on, it depends on the location and also depends on what your occupancy is going to be on an annual basis. So if you're buying a hotel that's somewhere, you know, in a, in a suburb, really, really Northern Ontario, you might not see a very high occupancy. So you also have to make sure that is the cost of the property. When will you start to see that profit? When will you start to see an ROI? So it really, it really depends on you doing a deep dive into the financial to make sure that in the end of the day, when and make a make um some projections right for annually mm -hmm. to look at occupancy to look at your ROI and just make sure that it makes sense because you also want to make sure that for me I mean I love hotels I think when they're managed properly you can absolutely see ROI but you do have to do the work right you can't just buy this property and it's magically going to make money you have to be able to know the industry know how to increase the occupancy know how to increase the ADR and that's where you'll start to see that turnaround and, and that influx of revenue as you said. ADR as an average daily right, average daily rate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I just want to make sure because there's you know like there's different terms and and you know, hotel no, terms. I'm sorry. No, no, you're right. I, I use so much hotel <laughs> lingo, well, so not everybody understands. Yeah. So what are some strategies? So like there's you know I mean even just somebody that has you know a bunch of Airbnbs currently, I'm sure there's you know similar strategies that could probably go across the board. But what are some things that you are seeing work well in terms of increasing your daily rates, in terms of increasing occupancy that you've you've done um, throughout maybe you know different locations? We don't talk about Airbnb. Right. <laughs> I don't think they're good. Oh, you know what? I think for every. Every city, which I think yeah. is like every little area of Toronto was very different. So, for example, we have hotels in downtown Toronto. We also have hotels in Vaughan. And both hotels have such a different mix of business. So downtown, you'll see a lot more leisure. And you'll see a lot more leisure travel means you'll see a lot of families traveling. You'll see people that are coming just to be on vacation or staycation or that type of thing. Mm -hmm. You won't see a lot of that leisure business. 
Um, you'll see a lot more corporate travel. You'll see a lot more people traveling, whether it's for groups or it might be sports tournaments. In Bonn, we have a lot of, you know, hockey teams that come through, baseball teams that come through that are playing in the area. They're doing, uh, you know, various tournaments. Whereas downtown, you don't see a lot of that. So I think the mix of business in each area is very different. Um, so depending on where you're looking to invest, you also need to kind of do a little bit of research around that area to find out, are there conventions here? Are there sports tournaments? Is it, is it, is there an industry? So for example, we have hotels um, in Thunder Bay and in Thunder Bay, there's a lot of mining business. Mm -hmm. So our team makes sure that they look into that mining to say, okay, are there companies here that need hotels? What are their needs? Um, every area in, you know, any area in the world, it's very different in terms of the need for a hotel to do well. They have to meet the needs of that area. Yeah. Uh, and, and you said it well now. I'm assuming you have a team of people that are doing this research. Like it's not just you and your family. Yes. And, yes, yes. and you have, you know, researchers and, and whatnot. Like what does that look like? Like in terms of like your team um, to help with all that stuff? Like do you have, you know, how much how much staff do you have? Not in the hotels because I think that's a different thing altogether, but. Yes, no, overall, no, you're absolutely right. So when we were smaller, it was just me. And it was just, you know, sitting on Google Maps or even yeah. Google Maps was a thing. It would be just driving around, right? And just trying to figure out. Actually, it's a funny thing. Way back before technology, when we would buy hotels back in the 90s, because it's very competitive, one thing that we would do, and every hotel you does this, if you're like older like me, if you would drive to the competitor, then basically it's, it count cars. It's, it's literally a thing. But you would count the cars in the court law, and that's how you would figure out what their occupancy was. Now, yeah, now there's technology, so hotels actually share their occupancy and their ADRs, and it just helps to be competitive. Um, anyways, you're off track from your question, and I don't think I remember what your answer was. Oh, I was just talking about your, your team, right? Like, you probably have a handful of, of people that are doing all this stuff at this point. Like, 20, 25 hotels is a lot to manage. Um, and, and as you're, it sounds like you're still acquiring and you're still looking for opportunities. So, um, yeah, maybe walk us through what that looks like from a team standpoint. Sure. So we have a sales marketing department and we have operations department. We also have HR. So within those, within those departments, we have quite pretty large team. Then we also have regional people. So for example, we might have someone that is based in downtown Toronto that will do that research as you said to understand what does what does the sales and marketing piece look like for this hotel and where is the business coming in from. Um, we have team members that will specifically look at conventions and what's happening in the city, what's happening outside of the city. Will there be compression? How can you know how can we get that business? Um, so there's definitely, I mean, we started off with no departments and you know, one person doing 15 things. And now we've expanded. So now we definitely have different departments for legal, HR, um, sales and marketing, operations. It's it's really important to be able to have have that differentiation. Who manages that? Is that you? All of the departments? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so there's there's many layers to the organization. Um, you have a COO and a senior VP of ops that kind of manages all of that. And then my dad and I manage the executive team. Okay. All right. And and what does your brother and your mom do for the business? So my brother is more so on the VC side of things, mm -hmm. so he's not as involved on the hotel side of things. Right. My mom is the true leader of the company. Yeah. There is no check that leads the company to my mom. Nice. Literally, nice. she that. signs off on everything. Awesome, awesome. So what is, talk to us a little bit about the VC company side of things. Oh, uh, yes. Rogue is my capital. It is, it is so fun and it is amazing. So I love business and I love any kind of business. Mm -hmm. um, my brother and I have always known we want to work together since we were really, really small and it was just it was just this this notion that one day we're going to start something. So when he graduated with his MBA from Columbia, we both said, okay, you know what? He can go work for any other company or we can start something on our own. Um, and so we created this VC and our main aspiration or our main goal is to be able to fund and help minority and female founders. And we've just seen some really incredible companies and really incredible founders. Oh, very cool. So now are you looking at like companies in Canada or globally or? We look globally. We look globally. Yeah, okay, very cool. So you essentially find startups and entrepreneurs and then you just help them like scale and build their business. Absolutely. Is that usually like prop tech related or like it could be any type of business? It's actually any type of business. So we have seen some prop tech. We've seen AI. We've seen environmental. We've seen financial. We're, we're kind of all over the map. Um, and what we really truly look for is an idea that absolutely makes sense, an idea that has some sort of impact on the world as well, as well as founders you know, when you have a good founder, you know, you know, when someone had that vision and you know, when they have the ability to execute on that vision, that is really important. So those are the things that we, that we sort of look for. 
It is interesting because as a real estate investor, I've been doing this for 10 years. There's that whole other side of, you know, entrepreneurship and VCs and angel investors that we're like uncovering because we have a, a prop tech business as well. And, you know, as a real estate investor, you don't even know that there's a whole realm of, of opportunity that exists. And, and it is actually really cool. Um, and there's, you know, like the innovation companies. I mean, you're probably familiar with them uh, across Ontario and they have different courses to help entrepreneurs and, and uh, you know, set them up with uh, with opportunities to, to scale their business. So it is it is really cool. Um, the whole active side of things. Mm -hmm. um, you got the VC thing. I think you also wrote a book, I believe. Tell I us did. about yeah. that. Yes, for sure. So I wrote a book, it's called Ambitious, and it's just something that when I was really, really small, I wanted to do. I, I just had this in my heart that one day I wanted to have a book. I, when I was small, I thought it would be a children's book. Um, and I would, you know, I, I would start drawing illustrations and realize very quickly that I cannot draw. Um, but I still just wanted to have a book one day. Mm -hmm. um, meditation. So I've been meditating for many, many years. And I started teaching in 2014. Um, I just for free. I would just go out to one of my hotels and I would, you know, put it on Eventbrite and just see who kind of come to the door. But every time I would teach, I would kind of handwrite a sort of a lesson that I would want to give to the students that would come in. And I kind of knew that one day all of these lessons would become a book. And last year I decided I need to do this now. So I, 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 you know, took everything, took all the notes and put it into the book, which became auspicious and it launched last fall. Amazing. And where can somebody buy that? Is it on Amazon? Yes, it's on Amazon. Um, it's also on Audible. It's on iTunes. It's, it'll be on Spotify in about a week. Um, so you can either buy a hard copy or you can listen to it as well. So you have a lot of moving pieces. Congratulations. That's amazing. How do you stay sane? Like, like, do you have a morning routine or do you have something that you do that's like, this is how I have the energy? I mean, you're so bubbly, which is amazing. And you're like, you've got the energy. How do you manage it all? Meditation. Okay. So I'm telling you, so my morning routine, when I wake up, I will do a meditation and then I work out. If I don't do one of those two things, I would be a crazy person. I need to do <laughs> both those things every day. And I, I feel like I would absolutely, I would not be sane. Like it would just, it would not be a thing because meditation just really, it really kind of aligns me and connects me to the universe and connects me to my purpose. And I also just love working out. I think it's important to keep your body moving. Um, and it's also just a way to relieve stress, you know? So if I don't do those two things, I would definitely be a crazy person. Now, how did you always meditate and work out? Or is that something that came, you know, more recently? Um, meditation, I would say, started in about 2010. But I was also a very spiritual person. So I think my faith has always been something that's kept me going. And working out, yes, I used to love to run. I would find work classes. So it's just something that because I have a lot of energy, I also dance as well. So it was always doing something active. Nice, nice. I uh, I love the working out thing as well. I do yeah. like oxygen, yoga, and fitness. They're a franchise. Ooh. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but it's like you're working out in a sauna, pretty much like it's okay. like hot yoga temperature, and it's a workout. So I try to go once or twice a day. Wow. Well, yeah, you know, I've started the two a days like for I would say maybe a few months now. I like I enjoy Thanks. it. Um, but yeah, no, like same thing. I would go crazy if I didn't have some kind of fitness in my life. Yes, but <laughs> some kind of outlet, right? I completely agree. It's uh, it just clears your brain to be able to, you know, take on more and then just to have the ability to have that mindset and the ability to have that energy. So a thousand percent. Your arms look sick, by the way. They're so oh, thank big. you. Yeah, that's, so that's the working out over two. Yeah, I'll drink a toy a day. I'm like, all right, what do you go? But no, it's uh, you know, what? it is it was one of those things. And I don't think I could do it if I was just going to a regular gym. But because they have like different classes throughout the day, you're not going to the same one, which actually yeah. helps. It changes that for sure. Yeah. For I sure. love I love the franchise. Maybe one day I'll buy one. Who knows? Um yeah, but... we're gonna manifest it. Yeah. I don't I don't know right now with all the different moving pieces if I can I can do it right now, but it's at some point, at some point. Um so what's next for you guys? I mean, you're obviously, you know, scaling and you're building, um, you know, what, what are like some of the next things that you're working on? Uh, one of the most exciting things for me that I'm working on is to be able to build my own boutique hotel. Um, so it's something also that I've always wanted to do. And as I've worked mm -hmm. all these different franchises, I've been making notes, spy notes, you know, mm -hmm. works and what doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm in the process of building, building something out that would sort of be a Gupta boutique hotel. Nice. Whereabouts? I would love for the first one to be in Toronto um, because this is my city and I love it. And I think it would be really fantastic to have the first one here. Uh, so that's what we're looking at right now. If we can find a site that would make sense uh, for this kind of uh, concept brand. 
Very cool. And now when you say boutique, like, would you like make the wellness meditation working out part of it? Wow, that. What's your vision for it? Do you hear any background noise? No. You're there? Perfect. Okay. Um, so yes, it would be meditation, definitely. Wellness, 100%. Mm-hmm. A place where people can just go relax and not feel like they need a vacation from their vacation. Nice. I love that. Yeah. When uh, when we bought the land, so which is six acres in in the core, thus, um, I wanted to create something that had like a vision that was okay. every cabin is a different theme, that kind of stuff. So we're still bu- building it out, but that wellness component is huge. And I think like people are looking for that, right? Is is a place to be able to go and like feel rejuvenated, not like they need a vacation from their vacation. Yes, one of them. You know, and and sometimes people have to go miles and miles and fly, but you know, we try to bring it as close to home as possible and and make it all seasons. So um, it's it. really cool, but it has its challenges, right? I'm sure you guys are experiencing like you know, I think just in real estate in general, the more that you do and the more you you know you purchase, the more problems you have. And uh, but you know, it, it's it's good problems and they're manageable, and you know, it's uh, it's just about building and and continuing. So. Um, what can you tell, you know, somebody uh, from a, a piece of advice um, who might be, you know, trying to, you know, buy something, a little boutique hotel has a vision that they want to maybe incorporate some wellness uh, into, like, what are some, you know, tips and insights that you can provide them to, you know, take action? A hundred percent. I think if you have this dream in your heart and you have this this vision of wanting to own a hotel or, or whatever it is, we'll, we'll stick with hotel. You have to follow through. And I think a lot of times people say, OK, I want to buy this hotel but then they might not follow through in the idea or they'll immediately talk themselves out of it and they'll say, okay, but I don't think I can do this right now. And I'm not sure what hotels, that's not my background, but I think that the first step in achieving your in achieving your dreams and achieving your goals is to be able to tell yourself that you can and tell yourself that I can achieve my goals and also make a plan for it. If you want to get the help, it's fantastic. Have a plan though. Don't just go into it blindly, do your research, you know, connect to people. I feel a lot of times people don't like to connect and network and they get scared to ask for help but if you if you reach out to anyone just say listen i need 10 minutes of your time i just have a couple questions people will help you know they will absolutely help especially if you're upfront to say i need five to ten minutes of your time that's it and i have i want to ask you x y and z it's really easy and i think when you go into any of your dreams especially with hotels just have the knowledge and make sure that you do your research and we hoteliers are very friendly we are all here to help so definitely i would say just, just reach out and, and make that connection Amazing. That is awesome. Thank you so much for being on the show. It was a, a pleasure having you on. I mean, I feel like we could, you know, continue oh, on for hours right. and hours and go into different directions because like you have, you know, a few different businesses going like you've got the VC piece, which I think is, you know, is awesome as well and has a lot of opportunity to help other other businesses. And you've got your hotel and, and the book and um, where can my listeners reach out and find out more if uh, if they wanted to connect? Sure. Um, we can connect on Instagram. So my Instagram handle is at readthegoop.official. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn. So pretty easy to find. Okay. All right. Amazing. Thank you so much for being on the show. It was a pleasure having you on. Thank you, Sarah. Have a good day. Thanks so much for listening to Where Should I Invest with your host, Sarah Larvey. Make sure to listen in next time. We'll catch you on the next episode of Where Should I Invest.